and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Robner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping this week on Thursday, May 2nd at 10 a.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. We are joined today by a video conference by Alice Miranda Olstein of Politico. Hello, Sarah Carlin Smith of the Pink Sheet. Hi, everybody. And my KFF Health News colleague, Roshana Prada. Hello. No interview this week, but more than enough news to make up for it, so we will dig right in. We will start again with abortion. On Wednesday, Florida's six week abortion ban took effect. Alice, what does this mean for people seeking abortions in Florida, and what's the spillover to other states? Yeah, this is a really huge deal, not only because Florida is so populous, but because Florida, somewhat ironically given its its leadership, has been a real abortion haven since Roe versus Wade was overturned. A lot of its surrounding states had near-total bans go into effect right away. Florida has had a 15-week ban for a while, but that has still allowed for a lot of abortions to take place. And so a lot of people have been coming to Florida from Alabama, Louisiana, those surrounding states for abortions. Now Florida's six-week ban is taking effect. And that means that a lot of the patients that had been going there will now need to go elsewhere. And a lot of Floridians will have to travel out of state. And so there are concerns about whether the closest clinics they can get to in North Carolina and Southern Virginia will have the capacity to handle that patient overload. And so I talked to some clinics that are trying to staff up. They're even thinking about, you know, physical changes to their clinics, like building bigger waiting rooms and recovery rooms. So this is going to cause a real crunch in terms of healthcare provision. And that is set to not only affect abortion, but with these clinics overwhelmed, that takes up appointments for people seeking other services as well. And so my colleagues and I have been talking to People in the sending states like Alabama who worry that the low-income patients they serve who were barely able to make it to Florida will not be able to make it even further. And then we've talked to providers in the receiving states like Virginia who are worried that there just are simply not enough appointments to handle the tens of thousands of people who had been getting abortions in Florida up to this point. And of course, what ends up happening is that if people have to wait longer, it pushes those abortions into later types of abortions, which are more complicated and more dangerous and more expensive. Yes. And while the rate of complication is low, the later in pregnancy you go, it does get higher. And so that's another consideration as well. I will flag, though, that restrictions on abortion pills in North Carolina, which is now one of the states set to receive a lot of people, those did get a little bit loosened by a court ruling this week. So people will not have to have a mandatory in-person follow-up appointment for abortion pills like they used to have to have. So that could help some patients who are traveling in from out of state, but a lot of restrictions remain and it'll be tough for a lot of folks to navigate. While we think of that, oh, well, there's at least, you know, you can get abortions up to six weeks. My friend Selena Simmons Duffin over at NPR had a really good explainer about why six weeks isn't really six weeks because of the way that we measure pregnancy, that six weeks is really two weeks. So it really is a very, very small window in which people will be able to get abortions in Florida. It's not quite a full ban, but it is quite close to it. Well, speaking of full bans, after several false starts, the Arizona Senate Wednesday voted to repeal the 1864 abortion ban that its Supreme Court ruled could take effect. The Democratic governor is expected to sign it. Where does that leave abortion law in the very swing state of Arizona? It's kind of a muddle, isn't it? It is. So the basics are that a 15-week ban is already in place and will continue to be in place once this repeal takes effect. What we don't know is whether the total ban from before Arizona was even a state will take effect temporarily because of the weird timing of the court's implementation of that old ban and the new repeal bill that just passed that the governor is expected to sign very soon. So the total ban could go into effect at least for a little bit over the summer. Planned Parenthood is petitioning the court to not let that happen, to stay the implementation until the repeal bill can take effect. 
So all of this is very much in flux, of course, as we've seen in so many states, you know, that leads to patients and providers just being very scared and not knowing what's legal and what's not, and folks being unable to access care that may, in fact, be legal because of that. Of course, this is all in the context of Arizona, as well as Florida, being poised to vote directly on abortion access this fall. And so if the total ban does go into effect temporarily, it's sure to sort of pour fuel on that fire and really um, rile people up ahead of that vote. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Well, now that we are talking about politics, this week we heard a little bit more about how former President Trump wants to handle the abortion issue via a long sit-down interview with Time magazine. And I will link to that interview in the show notes. The biggest, quote, news he made was to suggest that he'd have an announcement soon about his views on the abortion pill. But he said that would come in the next two weeks. The interview was, of course, more than two weeks ago. They did a follow up two weeks later, and he still said it was coming. I guess he said in the in the follow up interview, he said it would be next week, which this is already passed. Do we really expect Trump to say something about this? Or was that just him deflecting, as we know he is wont to do? Well, I'm sure that he's getting pressure to say something, right? Because as people have noted now quite widely, regardless of of individual state laws, you know, there are certainly conservatives that are pushing for him and his future administration to, you know, ban the mailing of abortion pills using uh, the Comstock Act from the 1800s, which would basically annihilate access to that form of terminating pregnancies. So there are also some who want him to just repeal the FDA approval, right? Right. And of course, the Biden administration has made it easier for folks to get access to those to um, mifepristone in particular, one of two pills that are that are used in medication abortion. But yeah, will it be two weeks? I think he obviously knows that this is a potential political liability for him. So whether he'll say something, I'm sure he will get competing advice as to whether it's a good idea to say something at all. So we'll have to see. Well, speaking of Trump deflecting, he seemed to be pretty disciplined about the rest of the abortion questions. And there were a lot of abortion questions in that interview, uh, insisting that while he takes credit for appointing the justices who made the majority to overturn Roe, Everything else is now up to the state. But by refusing to oppose some pretty out there suggestions of what states might do, Trump has now opened himself up to apparently accepting some fairly unpopular things like tracking women's menstrual periods, unless you think that's an overstatement. The Missouri state health director testified at a hearing last week that he kept a spreadsheet to track the periods of women who went to Planned Parenthood, which, according to the Kansas City Star, quote, helped to identify patients who had undergone failed abortions. Yet none of these things ever seem to stick to Trump. Is any of this going to matter in the long run? He's clearly trying to walk this line between not angering his very anti-abortion base and not seeming to side too much with them, lest he anger a majority of the rest of the people he needs to vote for him. Well, he's also not been consistent in saying it's totally up to states. Whatever states want to do is fine. He's repeatedly criticized Florida's six-week ban. He refused to say how he would vote on the referendum to override it. He has criticized the Arizona ruling to implement the 1864 ban. So this isn't a pure whatever states do is fine stance. This is whatever states do, unless it's something really unpopular, in which case I oppose it. And that is a tough line to walk. And The Biden administration and the Biden campaign have really seized on this and are trying to say, okay, if you are going to have a leave it to states stance, then we're going to try to hang on you every single thing states do, whether it's the legislature or a court or whatever, and say you own all of this. So that's what's playing out right now. I highly recommend reading the interview because the interviewer was very skilled at trying to pin him down and he was pretty skilled at trying to evade being pinned down. Well, meanwhile, Republican attorneys general from 17 states are suing the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from including abortion in a list of conditions that employers can't discriminate against and must provide accommodations for under rules implementing the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. The new rules don't require anyone to pay for anything, but they could require employers to provide leave or other accommodations to people seeking pregnancy-related health care, and the EEOC has included abortion as pregnancy-related health care. This is yet another case that we could see making its way to the Supreme Court. And ironically, the the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act was a very bipartisan bill. So there are a lot of anti-abortion groups that are extremely angry that this has been included in the the regulation. 
this is one of those sort of abortion adjacent issues that tends to drag abortion in even when what it was never expected to be there. And we're going to see more of these, right? We're going to get back into the spending bills as Congress tries to muddle its way through a, through another session. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think about this, even though there's a regulatory battle and a legal one now too, kind of like in the immediate aftermath of the Dobbs decision when there were employers, I kind of think about it more practically, you know, which is that there were employers that were saying we would cover expenses or they would pay for people to travel out of state if that was something that they needed. I wonder how many people would actually do it, even if it exists, right? Because that's a whole other, I mean, you know, getting an abortion or even things related to pregnancy are like incredibly private things. And so I I don't know how many women would be willing to kind of stand up and say, hey, um, I need this accommodation and you have to give it to me under federal regulations. So in a way, I think it's notable both that the EEOC put out those regulations and that there's litigation over it. But I wonder if it, practically speaking, just how much of a, an impact it would it would really have just because of those sort of privacy and practical hurdles associated with divulging information in that regard, right? As we were just talking about, somebody in Alabama, the closest place they can go and get an abortion is in North Carolina or Virginia, they go, hey, I need three days off so I can drive halfway across the country to get an abortion because I can't get one here. I kind of see that might be an awkward conversation. Just like any sensitive sort of medical or health related needs, it's not like people are rushing to tell their employers necessarily that it's something that they're dealing with. So that's true. And it doesn't have anything to do with privacy. Most people are not anxious to advertise any health related issues that they are having. Speaking of people and their sensitive medical information, that Change Healthcare hack that we've been talking about since February, well, the CEO of Change's owner, United Health Group, was on Capitol Hill on Wednesday, taking incoming from both the Senate Finance Committee in the morning and the House Energy and Commerce Committee in the afternoon. Uh, Among the other things that Andrew Witte told lawmakers was that the portal that was hacked did not have multi-factor authentication, and he confirmed that United paid $22 million in Bitcoin to the hackers, although, as we discussed last week, they might not have paid the hackers who actually had possession of the information. Nobody actually seemed to follow up on that, which I found curious. My favorite moment in the Senate hearing was when North Carolina Republican Tom Tillis offered CEO Witte a copy of the book Hacking for Dummies. Has anything been a result from these hearings other than what it seemed a lot of lawmakers getting to express their frustration in person? Can I just say how incredible it is to me that a company that their net worth is almost $450 billion, one of the largest companies in the world, apparently does not know how to enforce rules on two factor authentication, uh, which is something I think that is very routine and commonplace among (laughs) the modern industrialized uh, workforce. (laughs) I have it for my Facebook account. Right. Um, I think everyone even in in our newsroom knows how to do it or has been told that this is necessary for so many things. And I just find it absolutely unbelievable that the CEO of United would would go to senators and say this and think that it would be well received, and, which it was not. So I will say his body language seemed to be very apologetic. He didn't sort of come in guns blazing. He definitely came in thinking that, oh, I'm going to get kicked around and I'm just going to have to smile and take it. But, you know, obviously this is still a really serious thing. And a lot of members of Congress, a lot, both the senators and the House members said they're still hearing from providers who still can't get their claims processed and from people who can't get their medications because pharmacies can't process the claims. And, you know, there's a lot of dispute about how long it's going to take to get things back up and running. And one of the interesting tidbits that I took away is that as much of healthcare that goes through change, it's like 40 percent of all claims. It's actually a minimum part of United's health claims. United doesn't use change for most of its claims, which kind of surprised me. Um, which maybe why United isn't quite as freaked out about this as a lot of others are. But, you know, is there anything Congress is going to be able to do here other than say to their constituents, hey, I took your complaints right to the CEO? I mean, I think there's two things they may focus on. One is just cybersecurity risks in healthcare, which is broader than just these incidents. I mean, and in some ways, it could be much worse if you think about hospitals and medical equipment being hacked there, where there could be direct patient impacts and care because of it. And the other thing is United is such a large company and the amount of Americans impacted by this, but also the amount of different parts of healthcare 
they have expanded into is really under scrutiny. And I think it's going to bring a light onto how big they become, the amount of vertical integration in our health system and the risks from that. We went through this in the 90s. That vertical integration would make things more efficient because everybody would have what they called aligned incentives. Everybody would be working towards the same goal. And instead, we've kind of seen that vertical integration has just created big behemoth companies like United. I don't know whether Congress will get into all of that, but at least it brought it up into their faces. So there's lots of regulatory news this week. I want to start with the FDA, um, which finalized a rule basically making laboratory developed tests medical devices that would require FDA review. Sarah, this has been a really controversial topic. Um, what does this rule mean and why has there been such a big fight? So this rule means that diagnostic tests that are developed, manufactured, and then actually kind of get processed and the results get processed at the lab will now no longer be sort of exempted from FDA's medical device regulations and they'll have to go through the process of medical devices. And the idea is to basically have more oversight over them to ensure that these tests are actually doing what they're supposed to do. You're getting the right results and so forth. Initially, over the years, the amount of the prevalence of these tests has grown and what they're used for, I think, has sort of changed and developed where FDA is more concerned about the safety and the types of health decisions people may be making without proper oversight of the tests. So one, I think, really infamous example that maybe people can use to understand this is Theranos was sort of a company that was kind of exempted from a lot of regulations because of being considered an LDT. The initial impact is going to be interesting because they're actually basically exempting all already on the market products. There's also going to be some other exemptions, such as for tests that meet an unmet medical need. So I think that will have to be defined. And there is a reasonable chance that there's going to be lawsuits challenging whether FDA can do this on their own or need Congress to write new legislation. And there has been battles over the years for Congress to do that. And um, FDA, I think, has finally gotten tired of waiting for them to lead. So I think initially, you know, we're going to see a lot of battles going forth. And FDA also sort of just has limited capacity to review some of this stuff. I mean, we already know that, that FDA has limited capacity on the medical device side. I was sort of amused to see, oh, we're going to make these like medical devices where there's already a huge problem with FDA either exempting things that shouldn't really be exempt or just not being able to look at everything they should be looking at. Right. So they're going to take what they call um, a risk-based approach, which is a common terminology used at the FDA, I think, to focus on the things where they think there's the most risk of something problematic happening to people's health and safety if something goes wrong. And it's also an admission to some extent of something that's not necessarily their fault, which is they only have so much budget and so many people. And that really comes down to Congress deciding they want to fix it. Now, FDA has, you know, user fee programs and so forth. So perhaps they could convince the industry to pony up more money. But as you alluded to early on, one of the sort of fights over this has been their different segments of companies that make these tests that have different feelings about the regulations because you have more traditional medical device makers that are used to dealing with the FDA that probably feel like they have this leg up. They know how to handle a regulatory situation um, agency like FDA and get through. And then you have other companies that are smaller and do not have that expertise, maybe don't feel like they have the manpower and just money to deal with FDA. So I think that's where you get into some of these business fights that have also kept this on the sidelines for a while. Well, also, I wonder, I mean, hospitals also use laboratory developed tests too, right? And they develop them. So I, I, I feel like, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think previously when there was debate over whether FDA was going to do this, I think hospitals were pretty critical of any move of FDA to start regulating these more aggressively, right? Because they said, you know, for tests used for cancer detection or other health issues, I think that they were not thrilled at the idea. And I don't, you know, I don't know that they've had to really deal with FDA in this regard either when it comes to devices. So yeah, I know one big exemption that people were looking for was whether they were going to exempt academic medical centers, and they did not see what happens with that moving forward. But obviously, again, the older ones will sort of have this exemption. Well, speaking of controversial regulations, the administration has uh, basically decided that it's not going to decide about the 
potential menthol ban that we've been talking about on and off. Uh, There was a statement from HHS last week that just said, we need to look at this more. Somebody remind us why this is so controversial. Obviously, you know, health interests say, really, we should ban menthol. It helps a lot of people to continue smoking and it's not good for health. Why would the administration not want to ban menthol? It's controversial because, and I'll just say that it's an election year and they are worried about backlash from Black voters not supporting President Biden in his reelection campaign because they do this. It's a health versus criminal justice issue because the concern is that, yes, in theory, if black people make up sort of the majority of people use menthol cigarettes, you're obviously protecting their health by not having it. But the concern has been among how this would be enforced in practice and whether it lead to over policing of black communities and people being charged or facing any some kind of police brutality for sort of what a lot of people would consider kind of a a minor crime. And and that's where the tension has been, although like notably um, some groups like the N.A. Double ACP and stuff have been gotten on board with banning menthol. So it's sort of an interesting thing where we're sort of trying to solve a policing or criminal justice problem through a health problem rather than just solving the policing problem. Like Sarah said, you know, you have civil rights groups lined up on both sides of this fight. You have some saying that banning menthol cigarettes would be racist because they're predominantly used by the Black population. But then you have people saying, well, it's racist to continue letting their health be harmed and pointing out that those flavored cigarettes have been targeted in their marketing towards Black consumers and that being racist legacy that's been around for a while. And so there's these accusations on both sides. And it seems like the politics of it are scaring the administration away a little bit. Well, speaking of things that are political and that people smoke. The Drug Enforcement Administration announced its plan to downgrade the classification of marijuana, which until now has been included in the category of most dangerous drugs like heroin and LSD, to what's called Schedule 3, which includes drugs with medicinal use that can also be abused, like Tylenol with codeine, But apparently it could be a while before it takes effect. This may not happen in time for this year's election, right? Right. So they have to release a proposed rule. You got to do comments. You got to get to the final rule. You know, OMB, even like it's supposedly at OMB now. OMB could hold it up for a while if they want to. So as anybody who follows health policy in D.C. knows, nothing moves fast here when it comes to regulations. Yes. And and regulation that we thought was taken care of, but that actually only came out last week, would protect LGBTQ plus Americans from discrimination in healthcare settings. This was a provision of the Affordable Care Act that the Trump administration had reversed. The Biden administration announced in 2021 that it wouldn't enforce the Trump rules. But this is still a live issue in many courts. And it's significant to have these final regulations back on the books. Yes, it is. I think this is one of the ACA regulations that is ping pong the most ever since the law was passed because there have been lawsuits. I think it even took I want to say it took the Obama administration years to even issue the first one. I think knowing how controversial it was, um, I believe it was the second, I think it was his second term and it was, you know, when, when there was no fear of repercussions for his reelection. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a very, very long fought battle and I imagine this is also not the end of it, right? So, but no, it is, it, it is very significant the way that they define the regulations. I confess I was surprised when they came out because I thought it had already happened. I'm like, oh, we were still kicking this around. So now now they appear to be final. Well, finally this week, lots of news in health business. First, kind of an update from last week. The Federal Trade Commission is challenging so-called junk patents from some pretty blockbuster drugs, charging that the patents are unfairly blocking generic competition. Sarah, what is this and why does it matter? <laughs> FDA has what's known as an orange book as a part of a very complicated process set up by the 1984, I believe, Hatch-Waxman Act that was sort of a compromise between the brand and the generic drug industries to sort of get generic drugs to market a bit faster. And FTC has been accusing companies of improperly listing patents in the orange book that shouldn't be there and thus making it harder to get generic products on the market. In particular, they've been actually going against drugs that have a device component, basically saying these components, patents are not supposed to be in the orange book. And so they are basically asking the companies to delist the patent. So they actually have gotten some concessions so far from some of the other products they've 
targeted. The idea would be this should help speed some of the generic entrants. It's not quite as simple because you do have lots of patents covering these drugs. So it does make it a little bit easier, but it's not like it automatically opens the door. But it is unique and interesting that they have focused in on these targets because typically what are sometimes known as like complex generics are a lot harder for companies to make and get into the market because of the devices, because for safety reasons, FDA wants the devices to be very similar. So, you know, if you pick up your product at the pharmacy, you have to be able to just know how to use it really without thinking about it, even if it's- And obviously this covers things like inhalers and injectables. Right. The the new weight loss drugs everybody is focused on. Um, Inhalers has been a big one as well. Things like an EpiPen or stuff like that. So I think it's been interesting because- It does seem like FTC's had more immediate results, I guess, than you sometimes see in Washington. And Bernie Sanders has sort of piggybacked on what they're doing and sort of targeted these companies and products in other ways and gotten some small pricing cost concessions for consumers as well. But it will take a little bit of time for even if patents get delisted for generic drug makers to actually then go through the whole rigmarole of getting cheaper products to market. Yes, this is part of the, the what I call the, the 30 years war to do something about drug prices. And before we leave drug prices, we're still fighting in court about the Medicare drug negotiation, right? There were, the drug industry continues to lose. Is that where we are? Correct. They had their fourth negative um, ruling this week. And um, basically, um, in this case, the judge ruled on kind of two main arguments the industry was trying to push forward. One is that the drug negotiation program would constitute a takings violation under the Fifth Amendment. And one of the main reasons the judge in this district in New Jersey said no is because this is they're saying basically participation in Medicare and this drug price negotiation program are voluntary. The government is not like forcibly taking any of your property. You don't have to participate. Another big ruling from this judge was that this is not a first this program does not constitute First Amendment violations. What's happening here is a regulation of conduct, not speech. One of the more amusing things in the decision to me that I enjoyed is, you know, the industry has argued that they're basically being forced under this program to say, oh, this is when CMS and then work out a price that the price they work out is the maximum fair price, because that's the technical kind of terminology used in the law, that they're then somehow making an admission that any other price that they've charged has not been fair. And the judge basically said, well, this is a public relations problem, you know, not a constitutional problem. Nobody is telling you you can't go out and publicly disagree with CMS about this program and about the prices, you know, that you end up having to kind of enter into. You know, it's it's another blow. They have a lot of different legal arguments they're trying out in different cases. So as I sort of said, they've thrown a lot of spaghetti at the wall. So far, other arguments have failed. Some of the cases are kind of stalled on more technicalities, like the districts they've filed in. So there was another case that was heard, an appeal was heard yesterday in Pharma, like the main trade groups case, where they're trying to push on because of that. So there's going to be a lot more action, but so far looks good for the government. When this was first rolling out, including when CMS announced, you know, the initial sort of 10 drugs that would first be on the list, lawyers that I talked to at the time said that the arguments that the industry was making were... It was a reach to be diplomatic about it. And so I don't think anyone really thought that they would be successful. And it seems like that is, at least to date, that's how it's playing out. I repeat, it's a good time to be a lawyer for the drug industry. At least you're very busy. All right. Well, finally this week, we spend so much time talking about how big healthcare is getting. Walmart this week announced that it's basically getting out of the primary care business. It's closing down its two dozen clinics and ending its telehealth programs. This feels like another case of that, wow, it looks so easy to make money in healthcare until you discover that it's not. Right. And I think making money in primary care is certainly that's not where the, you know, people say, well, that's a real big cash cow. Let's go in there. Right. It's it's other parts of the healthcare industry. Yeah, one thing one thing that struck me about a quote in a CNN article from Walmart was how, you know, they were focusing on they wanted to do this, but they found it wasn't a sustainable business model. And to me, that then sort of just brings up the question of should healthcare be a business and the problems. Right. There's a difference between being able to sort of operate primary care and make enough money to pay your doctors and cover all your costs. And, you know, a big company like Walmart that wants to be able to show big returns for their investors and so forth. So there's also that distinction that something that's not attractive for a business model like that can still be viable in the U.S. 
this reminds me in a lot of ways of the the ill-fated Haven Healthcare, which was when Amazon and J.P. Morgan Chase and Berkshire Hathaway all thought they could get together because they were big, smart companies, could solve healthcare, and they hired Atul Gawande, who was one of the biggest brains in healthcare, and it didn't work out. So we shall continue. Anyway, that is the news for this week. Now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week we think you should read too. As always, don't worry if you miss it. We will post the links on the podcast page at kffhealthnews.org and in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Uh, Roshana, why don't you go first this week? This story that I'm going to suggest, it's in the Wall Street Journal, depressing like most healthcare things are. <laughs> it's about how, you know, millions of children, I think it's it's over 5 million children under the age of 18 are providing care to siblings, grandparents, and parents with chronic medical uh, needs and how they are becoming caregivers at such young ages, and in part because it is so hard to find and afford in-home care for people. So that is my that is my extra credit. All right, good story. Sarah? I looked at a piece in The Atlantic by Catherine J. Wu. America's infectious disease barometer is off, and it's focused on our initial sort of response in this country to bird flu and maybe where the focus should and shouldn't be. It has some interesting points about, you know, mis- repeat sort of mistakes we seem to be making in terms of inadequate testing, inadequate focus kind of on the most vulnerable workers and what we need to do to protect them in this crisis right now. Alice. I chose an AP investigation collaborating with Frontline about the use of sedatives when police are arresting someone. And this is supposed to be a way to safely restrain someone who's, you know, combative, or maybe they're on drugs, or maybe they're having a mental health episode. And this is supposed to be like a non-lethal way to detain someone. And it has led to a lot of deaths, nearly 100 over the past several years. These drugs can make someone's heart stop. And the reporting shows, you know, it's not totally clear if just the drugs themselves are what is killing people or if it's in combination with other drugs they might be on or it's because they're being, you know, held down in a way by the cops that prevent them from breathing properly or or what. But this is a lot of deaths of people who have received these injections and, you know, is leading to discussions of whether this is uh, a best practice. So pretty depressing stuff, but important. Yeah, it was something that was supposed to help and has not so much in many cases. Uh, My story this week is from ProPublica. It's called A Doctor at Cigna Said Her Bosses Pressured Her to Review Patients' Cases Too Quickly. Cigna Threatened to Fire Her. It's by Patrick Rucker and David Armstrong. It's about exactly what the headline says. A doctor who spent too much time reviewing potential insurance denials because she wanted to be sure the cases were being decided correctly. It's obviously not the first story of this kind, but I chose it because it so reminded me of a story that I did in 2007, which was about a physician who worked for a managed care company. It was Humana in that case, who was pushed to deny care and first testified to Congress about it in 1996. I honestly can't believe that 28 years later, we are still arguing about pretty much the exact same types of practices at insurance companies. At some point, you would think we would figure out how to solve these things, but apparently not yet. Okay, that is our show. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our editor, Emery Hudeman. As always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at what the health, all one word, at kff.org, or you can still find me at X at J. Rovner. Roshna, where are you hanging these days? I am also on X at Roshna D. Perlan. Sarah. I'm at, at Sarah Carlin on X or at Sarah Carlin Smith on Blue Sky. Alice. At Alice Olstein on X and at Alice Miranda on Blue Sky. We will be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy. <laughs>